What is more idyllic for an American than kids playing on a hot summer day on the lawn? Whether it's running through a sprinkler, playing catcher tag, or a backyard barbecue, the stage for all of this is the historic anomaly known as the lawn. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 51 on July 23rd, 2022. Coming to you out of the Low Tech Institute's gardens in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. Today we're going to look at the history of problems with and alternatives to the Great American Lawn. We'll also have a few updates around the Institute. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at low underscore techno. Like us on Facebook. Uh, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org. There you can find our podcasts as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on their podcasts. Unless you hear me doing the ad, someone else is making money on that advertising. While all our podcast videos and other information are given freely, they take resources to make. And if you're in a position to help support our work and be part of this community, please consider becoming a monthly supporter for as little as $3 a month through our Patreon page, patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute. Thanks to Ryan W. who joined since the last episode. If you'd like to sponsor an episode directly, please get in touch with us through our website, lowtechinstitute.org. Lawns are seemingly everywhere, covering up to 2% of the continental U.S.'s surface. Recently, people have begun to question the worth of this ubiquitous part of the American landscape. So today we're going to delve into the history of lawns, briefly summarize the points against them, and then go into alternatives that may meet your needs better than you might think. So the word lawn comes from the same root as the word land, and it referred to a clearing in a forest. The word as we know it today, um, as a kept area of crop grass, dates to the 1700s. From the medieval period onward, lawns were really only found among aristocrats, who could either pay laborers to scythe the grass to an even shortness, or have sheep, rabbits, or horses graze carefully over grassy areas to create so-called green carpets. In the 16 and 1700s, the European aristocracy began to cultivate lawns to emulate romantic Italian landscape paintings. This allowed their opulent manor houses to be viewed in a large, managed landscape scene. By the 1800s, the lawns had become a mark of wealth. It was a form of uh, conspicuous consumption. Having a lawn was basically to say that the owner was so well off that he, and of course most landowners were almost always men, uh, could ostensibly waste a large area to maintain a cultivated uh, decorative field. In North America, early European settlers brought grass and clover seed from Europe uh, after they lost a lot of cattle, sheep, and goats to poisonous and less nutritious grass and forage uh, that was already native to the East Coast. Weeds were also brought over in ships, mixed in the animals' bedding, fodder, manure, and even in the ship's ballast. Some weeds spread ahead of human colonizers so quickly that when the Europeans moved into new areas, they assumed that the imported weeds were natives here as well. And I'll note that most of this history comes from Virginia Scott Jenkins' book, The Lawn, A History of an American Obsession. The lawn as we know it today didn't develop until the late 1800s with the advent of the real lawnmower, R-E-E-L. You know the one with the set of blades that spins as you push it? Before that, the closest approximation of a large area of crop grass was a pasture or recently harvested field. In the early 1900s, lawns were present but not as common as they are today as people either lived in built-up cities or rural areas. The real home of the modern American lawn didn't come around until the suburban explosion after World War II. In the pre-war cities, only the very wealthy had enough space for well-kept lawns. In the smaller towns, most people grew gardens or used green spaces for keeping chickens or other practical purposes. A bit of lawn could easily be kept with the push real lawnmower. And the lawns back then were not monocrops, but included dandelions, clover, and other ground cover. It was only after the war, with the expansion of largely white, middle-class suburbs and the keeping up with the Joneses mentality that the lawn started to become what it is today. And a part of that is due to bomb factories, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Over the last two centuries, lawns have become such a ubiquitous part of the American landscape that they seem, that they seem to have been around forever. They're an outward sign of class and an immediate marker of whether or not a household is taking care of its property. Just think of the social stigma of an unkempt lawn in the suburbs. You can just imagine all the neighbors commenting to one another on what an eyesore and unmowed property is next to all the other cropped masterpieces. Um, it's been 
a part of our society for enough generations that it's become deeply embedded. These types of visceral beliefs are harder to shake than, oh, say, cell phone use, which has only been around for less than a generation. For example, when we moved into the house that is the Low Technology Institute here behind me in the garden, it hadn't been lived in for two years. And the people responsible for maintaining the house had let many parts of the house languish, but a group of volunteers had kept the lawn mowed that entire time. Now, there is a time and a place for social pressure to move people towards right action, but there's also social stigmas and pressures that push us to do wasteful and downright terrible things. Lawns are a class-based, adoption of aristocratic ideals from the late Middle Ages. Is that how we want to be positioning ourselves for the future? We rarely question deeply embedded tropes of our society, but the next time you see an unkempt lawn and feel a pang of discomfort, stop and ask yourself, what's causing you to think that way? It isn't logic. Let's turn to some of the problems with lawns and we'll see why lawns just make no sense at all. And now, this is not meant to be an indictment of lawns. Many, many people have pointed out the problems with lawns and spent a lot more time on the issue than I'm going to. And I've listed some um, of them in the show notes. But to summarize, we can sort the problems into, let's say, six categories. The first category, of course, is ecological. Lawns do not appear in nature. Lawns are usually monocultures, literally excluding any type of biodiversity, which is inherently unstable for the environment, but also the grass species itself, if a single fungal uh, variety could wipe it out. Um, it's also less useful for the fungi and animal life that live with the lawn. Plus, at least in the US, the species that are used for lawns are non-native, and their cultivation reduces the prevalence of native grasses and plants. The next category is water, and depending on where you live, watering your lawn might be a significant waste of a finite resource. Americans average 12 inches of water on their lawns each year. That amounts to 40 million acre feet. To put that in perspective, the USDA calculated that 83.4 million acre feet were used in agricultural irrigation in 2019. Needless to say, wasting a third of irrigation on a crop that has no real utilitarian value should be seen as a problem. A quotation from the Washington Post sums it up nicely. Other folks are ditching their lawns because of the amount of water they soak up. Nine billions of gallons of it per day, according to the EPA. Think of the miracle that is the modern water supply. Pristine water pumped through hundreds of miles of shiny, state-of-the-art filtration systems and pipes, treated with miracle chemicals that keep our teeth from falling out of our heads, and available on demand at the twist of a knob. And then consider that we intentionally dump billions of gallons of that water out on the ground. The next problem is chemical. I'll start with a short story. Once upon a time, before World War II, lawn care handbooks suggested clover and chickens were a good way uh, to maintain lawn fertility. Then the U.S. created hundreds of bomb factories that turned atmospheric nitrogen into explosives using lots and lots of energy. It turns out that explosive material also works as a fertilizer, and so as the war ended and America experienced the baby boom, a white middle class exodus to the suburbs, and a strong economy, the natural step was for the bomb factories to begin selling fertilizer to one of the biggest crops in the country, lawn grass. Now, it was argued that clover and other so-called weeds should be avoided in favor of chemical fertilizers. Heck, why not use chemical herbicides to kill those weeds? Indeed, in 1999, 55% of households applied insecticides and 74% applied fertilizer. Studies show, however, that whatever you put on your lawn is also tracked into your home. Dust on surfaces, carpets, and floors often contain dangerous chemicals directly linked to lawn care. And their location in the house makes them especially dangerous to young children crawling on the floor and pets. For more on this, see articles by Robinson Sharp linked in the show notes. And then we have to consider the financial investment. Americans spend $30 billion on lawn care each year, which amounts to $750 an acre. From purchasing fertilizers and other chemicals to poison um, plants and insects to lawn care equipment that only gets used an hour a week, the lawn is nothing but a hole in the ground that you can shovel money into. If you own property with a lawn, chances are you're also paying to have access to parks where you can enjoy all the leisure benefits of a lawn without the expense. Next up is labor. The American Time Use Survey by the Bureau of Labor Statistics says the average American spends 73 hours a year on lawn care. And remember that this average includes everybody. So for those who actually own and maintain a lawn, that number is much, much higher since many others live in apartments without lawn chores and others are too young, old, or otherwise exempt from lawn work. And a CBS poll found that 20% of people named mowing their least 
favorite chore. And now I'm going to get onto my soapbox and talk about fossil fuels. The obvious culprit here with uh, fossil fuels in lawns is the mower. Because they don't have catalytic converters and run dirty, most mowers emit more in an hour than a car does driving 100 miles. Millions of tons of CO2 are emitted by lawnmowers. Perhaps surprisingly, leaf blowers are even worse because they are usually two-stroke engines and emit the equivalent of, a th of thousands of miles in a car with just half an hour of blowing. Um, a second less obvious problem is fertilizer. The 90 million pounds of lawn fertilizer applied each year produce twice that much carbon dioxide in emissions. And another study suggests that because not all fertilizer absorbed by the plants, for each acre of lawn, microbes convert extra fertilizer into a ton of nitrous oxide, which is a powerful greenhouse gas worse than CO2. But I can hear you asking, doesn't the lawn absorb CO2? And the answer is, sure. But the care and feeding of a standard lawn mean it emits five to six times the amount of carbon that it absorbs. I'm tempted to go on with the problems with lawns or go into more detail, but others do it better and in a lot more depth. I've linked to good articles in the, in the show notes. Um, and what I really want to move on to is solutions because those are less often talked about. What you can do with your lawn depends on a few factors. First and foremost, ask yourself what your end goal is. Do you want a lawn that looks like a lawn but isn't grass? Do you want a place to spend time outside with your friends and family? Are you looking to save time and money from maintaining a lawn or are you looking to make a statement against lawns? Um, or perhaps convert the lawn into something more functional like a, like a garden. Part of what you must prepare yourself for is not having a lawn. And there will be people in your neighborhood who don't like what you do. No matter what you do, no matter how nice it is, they, they will not like it. It's worth thinking carefully about why people have such deep-seated feelings about them and understand their point of view with a little compassion. There's a lot to do with class, social position, social pressure, American worth ethic, and many other factors, and most of your neighbors will not be at the same point you are in understanding lawns, their social history, and their ecological damage. There's a saying in Japan that the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. So if you choose to be the nail standing out uh, on your neighborhood, be prepared that not everyone will understand and you might get hammered down. Um, and with all the options though, you're going to have to be prepared for some growing pains. Part of the allure of lawns is that you can call a company and have a living carpet of grass delivered tomorrow as sod. The alternatives I'm going to propose are not that quick because they require new plants to germinate, take root, and grow or you'll have to build up new infrastructure. But let's talk about my favorite part about all these ideas, how to kill grass. Um, I used to work and mow lawns with a crew in high school. I mowed my childhood home's lawn, my in-law's lawn, and many, many others. Nothing gives me more joy than killing a lawn and putting in something else. And of course, we're gonna talk about chemical-free ways to do this. Now, Solarizing is the best all-around option. Solarizing uses the idea of a greenhouse to dry out and overheat weeds, or in this case, lawns. A large sheet of clear plastic, something like that goes over a greenhouse, is laid down flat over a lawn that you've previously mowed as low as you can. Put weights around the edges to keep it down, and ideally this would be after a few days of dry weather, with a few days of hot, clear, dry weather in the forecast. In just a few days, the sun will beat down on this covered lawn and heat the space under the plastic sheeting to well over 120 degrees. This will fry the grass or weeds and leave you in just a few days with a dead patch. However, if you're just putting in a few raised beds, perhaps, and want to keep grass walkways between them, you can do the same thing with cardboard boxes cut open and laid flat on the lawn. Usually two layers is best. This cardboard is then covered with mulch or soil to build up the growing spaces. The nuclear option, if you want to create a truly dead space like a driveway or other dirt path, is to use salt. The ancient idea of salting the earth despite your enemies works well to kill lawn and other weeds. Uh, just look at the side of well-salted walkways in the spring after the snow's gone where the grass has turned brown and died. This will not work if you want to plant anything here in the next year or two, not until the salt leaches out, but it is very effective. Let's say you want something that looks like grass, but doesn't require any maintenance. Clover is really a great option because it only ever grows about six inches high, so it never needs mowing. It has pollinator-friendly flowers, and it feeds nitrogen into the soil, so it never needs fertilizer. Um, so after solarizing, you can just uh, plant a monocrop of, of clover. 
You can even cut it occasionally and feed it to animals. We did this with our house in St. Louis and I really, really like the results. The main downside though is that it doesn't take traffic well, so you'll have to create a path or use uh, or, or use it in areas that are not walked on very often. Um, you could also go for moss in shady areas, or if you don't mind being in, being very brutal about containing it, actually the, the weed that most people hate called Creeping Charlie also covers the ground really aggressively, um, and this mint relative requires no mowing. Um, but if it does get into your garden area, you are in trouble, so use it very, very carefully. If you live in a dry environment, Look to native plants and ground covers that have evolved to live where you do now. In the southwest, xeriscaping is a great alternative to a green lawn. I'll talk about it a little later, and I don't have much experience with this, so you'll want to consult folks at your local nursery or in your local gardening group. Now what if you have a space that's going to get more traffic? Clover and other low maintenance ground covers usually aren't hardy enough, so just commit to what you're using that space for. If your backyard is primarily for entertainment and barbecuing with friends and family, consider making a large paver stone area to hold your grill, fire pit, and other outdoor spaces. If kids play in the backyard, consider creating a space covered in wood chips. The easiest way to do this is to buy landscape fabric, mow your grass as low as possible, and then smother it with the landscape fabric and six or more inches of wood chips. A stone or wood border will help keep things together. Outside of these designated areas, you can plant clover, moss, creeping charlie, or whatever other ground cover has appropriate uh, applications for your location. I know that some people enjoy lawn sports or just generally playing catch or throwing a frisbee on a lawn. So consider moving these activities to publicly maintained lawns to minimize your own personal footprint. If you absolutely must have your own space to do it, find grasses that are drought resistant and adapted for your area. I'm not going to get into the method of reseeding a lawn because that's not what I want to encourage. But what I will suggest is that add a good amount of clover seed to your whatever drought resistant local grass um, seed you can find. I know this sounds crazy, but it was commonplace before World War II and all the bomb factories being converted to fertilizer factories. Even if the clover won't reach its full potential because you're sometimes mowing it, it still won't, it will still pump a fair amount of nitrogen into the soil. To avoid emissions caring for your small area of lawn, switch to a real type uh, push mower um, because hopefully this is a small area. You won't need a power mower uh, for, for a smaller area. And uh, some people like electric mowers, but this is probably a lot of embodied emissions uh, to create an electric mower um, and the old fashioned real mowers are a lot easier on the environment when they're produced and also when they're used. Or learn to use a scythe, although that does take a lot, uh, a lot of practice. And do not water or fertilize this space. That's why you got the drought resistant variety of grass, remember? And by adding clover seed, uh, this will add nitrogen. The biggest change though will have to be mental. You need to get away from the deep seated feeling that many Americans have about a manicured so called beautiful lawn. Let's say you want to be a little more radical. And I already mentioned xeriscaping, which is turning uh, a lawn into what most of us would call a desert type landscape. This involves lots of drought resistant native shrubs and succulents and gravel and stones, as well as other low lying vegetation to cover the ground. This was once radical in the Southwest, but it is now increasingly common. A lot of places have incentives for you to do this. In more temperate areas of the United States, turning your lawn into a prairie is a great alternative. You'll want to consult with a prairie restoration outfit in your area, as they'll know the best local native seeds and plants, as well as methods. In either case, a small sign to indicate why your lawn looks different than everyone else's might go a ways to helping the shock value someone might find in an otherwise manicured suburb. Be sure to check with your HOA or local jurisdiction as some places have restrictions against thinking outside the box. If you live in such an area, this would be a good chance to raise awareness of the drawbacks of lawns and to agitate for change and freedom to choose not to be so destructive just to have a green carpet in front of your house. Another option is to create a garden where your lawn once dominated. Raised beds or row crops um, are all great ways to utilize otherwise wasted space. Now while you might be tempted to do this in front of your house, next to the road, uh, to make a statement, I would warn against growing any food within 30 feet of a roadway, as a recent PhD dissertation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison showed that the heavy metals and harmful chemicals in car exhaust settle out onto the ground and the plants within a 30 foot uh, radius of the side of the road. So as much as I love seeing gardens in the front of people's houses, the food there may be less than ideal. Um, because, all the, because of all the cars driving by, and I guess this is why we can't have anything nice. 
Um, front yards would be a good spot for pollinator plants or sacrificial garden crops to draw pests out of your garden uh, in the backyard. As I said before, putting down beds is an easy way to kill grass, either by solarizing it first or covering it with two layers of cardboard and then compost and soil in the rows and wood chips between for pathways. And I will mention, although I don't always live up to the standard myself, that the nicer you keep your lawn alternative in the publicly visible areas, the more likely your neighbors are to appreciate it and not notify the authorities about what you're doing. It's a shame that people have to put up a sign saying no mow may to avoid fines. People who don't mow their lawns sh should be thanked for reducing the amount of emissions sa they've saved by neglecting their lawns. And maybe if more people stopped taking care of their lawns, well-kept alternatives would become even more attractive. Lawns are an ecological catastrophe exacerbated by some feelings of conformity to some classist ideal. It's such a publicly visible statement about ourselves and much of the U.S. that it's very difficult to change people's minds about lawns. By creating something new and different and in every respect better on your own property, you can demonstrate to others that alternatives may actually be better than the status quo. And now for a brief recap of uh, something we've been doing here at the Institute. Last weekend we had a half a dozen people out to finish the wheat harvest and thresh and process some of the wheat and rye. It was great to see folks out here and get to talk about size, sickles, moisture content, seeding rates, and all the ins and outs of growing your wheat uh, at home. You can check this out in our video series on YouTube. We'll have parts two and three up on our YouTube channel soon, but part one covering field preparation and seeding is already up. Uh, imagine turning your lawn into a wheat field. That would certainly get the neighbors talking and probably would be quite an event as you harvest it the next summer. We will be harvesting our flax and having our annual flax to linen events this fall. For more details, be sure to sign up for our listserv, which you can find on our website. That's it for this week. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. The show is hosted and co-produced by me, Scott Johnson, and co-produced and edited by Hina Suzuki. This episode was recorded in the Low Technology Institute's gardens. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, uh, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you enjoyed this free podcast. If you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. Thanks to our forester and land steward level members, Marilyn Skirpon and the Hamvases for their support. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by its members, grants, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute, membership, and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. Find us on social media and reach me directly. I'm scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was Get Evil off the album Orphaned Media by Holiza. That song was in the public domain, and this podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Share Alike license, meaning you're free to use and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks, and take care. <laughs>